All right, <laughs> bet. We are officially on it. All right, charging system. What is the charging system? It's a subsystem that handles charging the high voltage battery. Now you could do what we did before and just uh, connect it up to a power supply. Oh, by the way, I got the OneNote open if you don't yet. Wait, what? The OneNote? Yeah, I, I have, I'm on the same thing. Perfect, okay, cool. Yeah, but you might remember what happened last summer where we trickle charged the battery with- um, Power supply. Big yeah, with a power supply. supply. Not ideal. Uh, the primary reason being, especially now, uh, yeah, no, even then, not a great idea because all of your cells will get charged to a slightly, slightly different voltage, and that's going to, like, decrease your performance and uh, affect the health of the batteries. And we're already kind of beating them up. I don't know how long we will use each battery pack because we haven't built one yet. So that's another point of consideration. But when you charge your battery, you want to do it properly. Now I get it. Essentially, we're doing the same thing with our, uh, whatchamacallit, with our official charger charger. But there are a lot of safety, safety systems built in and with the BMS, a functional BMS, um, that will take care of balancing all the series packs. We won't worry about balancing the parallel cells because they're in parallel. So they kind of, there's like this kind of like a passive balancing effect. Yeah. But we'll make sure that at least all of our series uh, sections will be charged up to the same voltage. Yeah. Um, so mostly safety, also health of the cells. Um, I tried to make a simplified, like, what, like, you know, I found that the problem with the charging system is that uh, no one had really described it as a whole. Yeah. And how it all kind of works and fits together and like some theoretical sequence of events. So I think this is how it would go because again, we've never actually charged our battery. <laughs> um, remove battery from the car. That's for the rules. So we'll probably drop our battery at the bottom, put it on the battery cart. Um, because the battery cart is the thing that houses the charger, um, the, shut, the charging shutdown circuit, a 12 volt supply to power all the low voltage because you don't have your car. Yeah. Um, and obviously it holds the big chunky ass battery. So I haven't figured out we haven't figured out whether we should use a battery as a supply or a power supply. You could do both. You know, that'd be pretty, pretty spicy. Um, but remove battery from car, then plug the charger into the place where the inverter was plugged in. Sounds weird on fir uh, first thing, but if you know what I'm talking about, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, supply battery with low voltage to power the BMS and turn on the charger and then go through resetting everything on the shutdown circuit and continue to monitor the battery through the BMS to check that everything is going as expected. So that's like roughly how the, how charging your battery should work. Um, when we actually go ahead and do that, we'll probably want to, you know, get some, get some data and statistics on how fast it's charging the end result, like how much variation are there in voltages? You know, what precision, like, are we talking a few millivolts difference? Cause you know, yeah. that ain't no big deal. Um, or are we talking like up to like tenths of a volt that starts to become more of an issue? Mm -hmm. um, right. So as a block diagram sort of deal, big picture, the system consists of the accumulator, the battery, um, the accumulator, BMS, and the AIRs are all one unit. They're all in the same box that you took out of the car. And the battery cart plus shutdown circuit, PCB, plus switch are another unit. That part does not go inside the car. Mm -hmm. um, the accumulator is completely disconnected from the car. So this includes all the high voltage and low voltage connections. What we'll have to think about when we're designing it for next year or <laughs> continuing to design 
um, is we'll need to map out all of the low voltage connections um, that are going to the accumulator. And we'll probably have to collaborate with Reese on that because I think he's still taking on the bulk of the battery, battery stuff. So we'll have to map out all of the connection, low voltage connections that are going to the battery. Um, and we'll have to figure out if, like how many connectors we're using, uh, what pins are connected to what, you know, actual signals and stuff like that, whether we want to have a separate connector for all the charging stuff, or if we just want to match up the things on like a not fully populated, like female end coming from the battery cart and stuff like that. Um, but there are way more logistic issues that we'll need to get through, even though it seems like somewhat of a straightforward subsystem because you're kind of recycling a lot of ideas and designs for the main car. Um, so the charger we're using is the Elcon PFC 2500. Don't ask me about justification for this <laughs> because I kind of just gave a suggestion to whoever was working on the battery team, or not the battery team, like whoever's working on this project in the class. Mm -hmm. How did I get this starting point? The, the subreddit, let's be real here. Um, well, starting we'll, point of most things. Right, we'll run it and we'll see if it's good for us we'll keep it. Um, if it really doesn't work out, then we'll have to look for another charger. But at a glance, it seems fine. It's fully sealed and waterproof IP46 rating. I believe the second number is the water resistance rating, which is the more important number for us. Um, vibration proof, yeah, whatever. Um, available for various kinds of batteries like lead acid, and lithium iron phosphate, I assume Lion will be in there too. Um, I believe the model number we got is probably this one down here because the maximum voltage is 417 volts and that's like right in our range, 312 to 417 volts. So that's pretty perfect. Output current, seven amps, uh, you can do the math on how long that'll take to charge, but I have a feeling that charging a battery is not gonna be a quick thing. Um, and just a few sanity check things. Yep, AC input voltage range, <laughs> 85 to 265. So technically if we go to Europe, we're still chilling. Mm -hmm. um, don't care about the rest of this stuff. Don't really, don't really give a shit. Uh, LED indicators, that's good. Protection features, whatever. Uh, they give you blink codes, which is kind of nice because it kind of eliminates any language barrier. Yeah. <laughs> um, they give you some safety stuff. Uh, so this is from their page. Um, I've also linked the owner's manual, which is loading pretty slowly and it's not going to rain. Um, this has different, there, so between like the product page, owner's manual, and there's like a few different documents floating around for this charger and a lot of them have overlapping information but they also have like little nuggets that aren't in any other documents so you'll probably need to look through everything if you're looking for um, a certain piece of info um they give you more technical features here um yeah so most as you can see there's a lot of overlap here's the diagram that i stole for the one note um there's an interlock function, which looked interesting, but we probably won't be using it anyways. Um, installation. I love the wording here. Best way. Okay. Forbidden. Forbidden. Love to see it. Um, they say, don't open it up. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, shoot. Oh, look at that sick background. It's kind of nice. Um, Anyways, there is, I also linked this website. I don't think we bought it from here, but they have a lot of good information straight up on their website. And they also give you the user manual and spec sheet, as well as the um, CAN bus information. This will be important. This will be very, 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 very important. Um, so this is something that we should remember is here. If you look in the OneNote, you should be able to find it very easily including can bus documentation. 
Cool. So that should be pretty explicit. Um, I stole their block diagram to kind of just add on and show what the system looks like. You got your charger connected to the battery and the two main leads. And then from out the cut, you got your two can lines that are also coming into the accumulator container. But that's like separate fr from the uh, shutdown circuit. Um, yeah, so I should probably include a box or something where like shutdown circuit, where like, okay, this is our cart. And then the shutdown circuit PCB is like over here and it has shit that goes to there. This is an excellent drawing, by the way. Right? It's beautiful. And I realized that I should have just used the zoom drawing instead of the uh, whatever. Whatever. It's fine. Um, I think I reiterate a lot of stuff. Oh, um, I briefly explained why we need a can, can uh, connection to the battery charger. So basically, the battery, the charger, uh, most of the flow of information should be going from the charger to the BMS because the BMS uh, has the microcontroller that'll be dealing with all the fault stuff. Mm -hmm. So the charger, any, any faults generated or signals from the charger will be like a subset of our BMS like faults. Um, so they'll monitor, like the charger will relay information such as hardware failure, like a backwards connection, a wrong input voltage, the state that it's in, whether it's charging or not charging. Um, yes. Cool. Um, interlock, not yeah, not really needed. Oh, I, I clipped the part of their data sheet. It's actually their, freak, their FAQ, their, their, their frequently asked questions page where they talk about what the um, interlock does. Um, yeah, and then I include more resources such as the 2019 ESF, I think, yeah, um, as well as the Michigan and Wisconsin ESFs. Now, I've taken the, the, uh, the extra step to chop out the relevant parts from there, so you don't have to scroll through 50 pages. Um, so hopefully this will be very, very, very easily accessible and people will access it a lot. I should hope they'll be looking at this sort of stuff. Um, right. I go through the 12 volt stuff. Oh, uh, and then I just like roughly what the charging shutdown circuit is. Um, it is basically a board that takes in fault signals from the AMS slash BMS and determines whether or not the 12 volt line in from the low voltage source on the battery cart is passed through the board to power the AIRs. So it basically takes fault signals and translates that into AIR control. Uh, right, okay, and then I just have some, some check your understanding, um, where it's like, what is the sequence of events if a fault is detected by the charger? What about the AMS directly? IMD question mark. And I'm like, it's all good, come back to it because we still haven't technically gone through the shutdown circuit itself. But yeah, that's actually a pretty good question to answer because if you're having someone design something for this, that is a very key question because it's sort of like, oh, so what's supposed to happen if there's a fault? Um, and now we're gonna go through what exactly happens when there's a fault, whoop de do. Um, the main function of the charging shutdown, oh yeah, yeah is to take signals from various sources and translate that into either opening or closing the AIRs. The method of control through which the shutdown circuit controls the AIRs is through the plus coil of the AIR, ah, the AIRs. I understand why people say airs, but it seems wrong to me. It is wrong, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, so the ground, uh, the negative side of the coil for the AIRs will be, um, tied to the microcontroller because there are times where we want to control when these are open, mostly during pre-charge. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if we just wanted them to be controlled by the shutdown circuit, then we would just ground them directly. Mm -hmm. I, that should be fine. Yeah, that should be fine because the shutdown circuit will still open them in the case of an emergency. Um, 
I recommend checking out the final report from this past year because say anything you want, I read through it and I thought their documentation was pretty solid. They just never really finished <clears throat> in the second semester, which I can forgive, but their yeah. documentation is pretty solid. That's good. They got an intro. Uh, they start by going over like where, where, we, where we were at with the Mingda mm -hmm. charger. They list the rules. Um, they actually have a good picture from the lecture slides, um, which is kind of hard to see right now. I zoom in. Whatever, I'll just make, I'll just do that. How about that? Um, it might, it's worth taking a look at this too, because it's basically a block diagram. Yeah. So yeah, that's pretty good. Um, uh, this is the latching circuit. GLV side shutdown circuit. Interesting. That's very, very interesting. Oh, I'll go over something. There's something I was confused about that I want to ask Chayvon about at some point. But methodology, whatever. Uh, they give you the schematics. The PCB, they actually finished designing the board. Um, and this is actually a really, really good paragraph for people to read because they basically step you through the circuit and tell you mm -hmm. how every little part works. Gotcha. It's pretty good. Mm -hmm. That's my TA. <laughs> Um, they give you a bill of materials, which is nice, and a summary of progress, as well, oh, as well as future steps. So this would be a really, really, really good document to pass on to someone who is working on this project, if they're from the class, because it will basically bring them up to speed as to what they should be continuing off of. There's no need to redesign anything with this shutdown circuit. All it needs to be, all that needs to be done is with this project is the board needs to be built. People need to start playing around with the charger. The cart needs to be built and we need to integrate all the systems together. Um, as I mentioned before, the low voltage connector on the battery, we'll need to figure out those pinouts. But moving on, the actual circuit. This is the meat of today. Actually like half the meat, not all the meat. Uh, okay, yeah. Give me one second. I will pause this recording and be right back. So with Los Circuitos, we've got, uh, annotate, I've got this connector over here, which is the input for the 12 volt, um, like, power, like power source that'll be on the battery cart. Whether this be a battery or a power supply, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, they're all drones. And then you've got your fuse over here. I haven't, I haven't really gone into fuse selection. Um, that's not such a big deal. I feel like you could, run, you could run the whole system off of one of those variables, power supplies, measure how much current it's drawing, and then just like select a fuse that's a little higher than that. Mm -hmm. that's, pretty, that's pretty simple. So, okay. Whoop. Schematic of shutdown circuit, two pin connector, right? Um, question, is the IM default signal normally high or normally low? Uh, low. That's what you would think, but actually it's normally high. So it's around nine volts ish. Um, and that's the name of the game for all the faults that we have. Um, mm -hmm when everything is going well, they'll be high and that it'll make itself clear as we go through the circuit. So what's our first part? That is whatever is boogieing over here. We'll look at that first. NOT, clear, clear, X, scroll. Um, what is this? I don't know. I looked at it first and I was like, this is weird. Well, it's an opto isolator. We talked about this a while back with the yeah. HV board, but this thing's kind of weird. Uh, the product page says one thing. The Altium thing says one thing. The data sheet kind of says another thing. It's a solid state relay slash phototransistor optocoupler. I'll do more research 
and add in a subsection that probably goes a little bit into solid state relays slash phototransistor optocouplers, why we use them mm -hmm. as opposed to just a normal transistor because it kind of yeah. seems to do the same thing. I don't know, man. Anyways, um, it looks like the main purpose is to completely separate two circuits, like the low, like one side yeah. and the other. Mm -hmm. I don't quite understand why we used it here because we're not dealing with a high voltage circuit. So, could yeah. you deal with the? Uh, no, never mind. I don't know. Yeah. So that 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 this device is definitely a Chabon question. Um, how does it work? Basically, instead of being an electromagnetic switch like in a relay, it, it has more in common with a transistor with extra steps to isolate the control and power sides. The function is basically the same as a relay. Um, this snippet right here from the data sheet probably has the most clear description as to what it is. It's a min miniature single pole normally open. So yeah, single pole normally open solid state relay um that provides power isolation super efficient or something uh the opti optically coupled output is controlled by a highly infra efficient infrared led so led infrared led internally shines when it's powered which coupled with the uh phototransistor closes that. You can see the symbol inside kind of looks like a BJT on that side. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, right. So the other part is pretty self-explanatory. Uh, we're looking at the opto, optocoupler right here, and we've got a 12 volt set reset switch. So what happens when you press those, those little buttons? When we press one of those, um, you basically turn this device on and it connects these two connects these two leads together so you press this button 12 volts boom through that resistor powers this turns it on boom these two leads connect together gotcha beautiful those, uh, were, the, those were the small little buttons on the side of the car right yep yep um oh cool so i talk about the 10k resistor Look, there's a 10K resistor in series. Uh, what was my initial uh, guesses as to why it's there? Uh, either dropping the voltage down or um, being a current limiting resistor, probably both. Mm -hmm. Because as you can imagine, the, if you think about a normal transistor, the turn on voltage is not 12 volts. It's usually much, 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 much lower. With a BJT, that's typically around 0.7 volts. Mm -hmm. So you don't need 12 volts. That's a lot, that's a lot, that's a lot of current, bro. Um, so um, why a 10K? Well, in the stuff, OK, so yeah. So in general, for stuff like transistors and LEDs or anything that operates off the basis of a PN junction, you look for a few parameters in the data sheet. Uh, to make use of. So if you select a transistor and you're trying to implement in your circuit, you want to look for your forward voltage and current. Mm -hmm. The forward voltage is basically like your, your turn on voltage yeah. that you need for the transistor. And so from the data sheet for this one, we've got a forward voltage. Oh, did I, did I attach the data sheet? Oh, I did. It's up here. Uh, the forward voltage is approximately 2.3 uh, two point, one second. One point two volts. One second. Yep. All right. So yeah, ten k, which is to drop down the that that twelve volt. Um. Yeah. So um, what what is it? Forward current is something between oh from the data sheet. Forward current is something between point two five milliamps and two milliamps. Mm -hmm. So with this info, we can drop a little circuit to figure out what resistor value we want. So this is like, you know, like if you were trying to figure out like, oh, do I need a resistor here? Yeah. Or what resistor should I put? Mm -hmm. So for the sake of simplicity, I've created the, the, the relay as a diode. Gotcha. And approximately, and approximated the input current as one milliamp. 
for like, you know, what we would be expecting. Yeah. Kind of splitting the difference between 0.25 and two. Mm -hmm. So as I've shown here, voltage drop over diode equals forward voltage equals 1.2 volts, current through diode approximately 1 million. Power source, unknown resistor, and our diode. Ah, question. With all this information, how would you figure out the resistance you'd want? V equals IR? Eh, hint. Current is the same for series components. Oh. So we know, uh, let me, and we know this voltage. We yeah. know this voltage. Mm -hmm. We know this current because one milliamp through here means that one milliamp is our current in our loop, right? Yeah. And all we need is our resistance right here. Yeah. So V equals IR. Yeah, basically. So what would our V equals IR be here? It would be uh, R equals V divided by I, which is 1.2 divided by roughly 0 0.001 amps. Close, almost. Um, we just forgot to do some subtraction because our voltage across our resistor oh, would actually be yeah. 12 minus 1.2. Gotcha. So if you take 10.8 and divide it by 0 0.001, you get roughly 10K. Woo! Woo! Nah. Lit. It's lit. Oh, I saved the screen. Wow, I did not mean to do that. <laughs> Um, by the way, yeah. one thing that I've gotten out of my new job is I've gotten into using uh, like LT Spice or P Spice mm -hmm. in like an actual CAD program instead of Circuit Lab. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's pretty spicy. It's, it's a, it's, LT Spice is free mm -hmm. and a lot nicer than Circuit Lab in my opinion. And it's really lightweight. Circuit Lab is what we use in 205. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but if you use something like LT Spice or even the um, like the P Spice sim part of ORCAD, which mm -hmm. you might use in 245, then yeah, it sets you up a lot better. 245 is my only in person class. Really? Wow. Yeah. When you get an in person class, but I don't. It's my only in-person class, and it's an 8 a.m. on Wednesday. You know, I would take that. I would take that. I honestly actually really like it because it will force me to wake up at a normal time on all the other days. Mm -hmm. you know? so otherwise oh. I would not. Oh. oh, no, no. You see, what's going to happen is you're going to stay up all night Tuesday until 8 a.m. Wednesday, and then you're going to sleep through the rest of Wednesday because you're going to be so drained. Absolutely not. I have other classes on Wednesday. Dude, I've, I've been talking, my, my friends are like, okay, so on Tuesday night, Tuesday night is Valorant night. You just stay up all night playing Valorant. I'm like, this is, that is not the night we're doing that. That Maybe is not that's gonna happen. Not on Tuesdays. Yeah, <laughs> days. but from, from experience, and this is with me working with one other person, which is probably allowed as long as you're not copying each other. And I don't know. I just, all I know is that the, the CS department rules do not apply here. <laughs> um, anyways, moving on. So we finished, we figured out this 10K resistor real quick. Um, and I think this serves as a nice little tiny, tiny little, um, if you ever need to select a resistor, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Cool. Let's move on to the next part. Um, so this part of the circuit is from over here. So that's our next focus. Um, what do we do here? Oop, oop, oop. Ah, yeah, I was trying, I was struggling on how I should organize my thoughts. So I just kind of put like a, a list down, just like navigating through it. So what this part of the circuit does, contacts A and B are open. So did these float somewhere? Anyways, contacts A and B are open. Um, those are the contacts on the opto isolator. Yeah. They're not connected. The IMD fault signal is low 
either because we had an error or the car was just turned on. Mm -hmm. So um, if there is an error, this will be low. And because this is low, this MOSFET will be off. And this node right here will be floating. Gotcha. Um, because if we trace this node that the MOSFET, con uh, that the MOSFET connects to, all the way down here. Well, right now it doesn't really do much. It just goes to one of the contacts on the on the on the relay. Oh, gracias. Um, but uh, we'll come to that. So, uh, right. So that's the IMD part. R three. Oops. R three and R four are biasing resistors. Um, notice how they form some sort of divider. So just as before we talked about um, our turn on voltage for a MOSFET being a lot lower than necessarily what would come out of here. Mm -hmm. um, you obviously just use like a voltage divider to step yeah. that down. Um, so that's what R3 and R4 are for. You would determine what those values need to be by leaving these values blank, drawing out the circuit a little bit and looking at the data sheet of the MOSFET and looking for, again, forward voltage, what you need for that. All right. Um, since the IMD fault is low, the MOSFET is off. So the drain, oh, all these got moved down a little bit. That's exactly what happened. All my letters got moved down. Poo. Um, right. So the drain is the bottom one, yeah. and the source is the top leg of the MOSFET right here. And this is the mm -hmm. gate, gate, drain, source, gate, drain, source. That got me a job. Wild. Um, since, all right, so the drain is not connected to the source, and thus node A is not grounded. Went over that. So what does this mean with the double pole, single throw, normally open, normally open relay on the right? <laughs> DPSC NONO. In this case, when the IMD fault is low and the reset button hasn't been pressed to close the opto isolator, both relay contacts will be open. So your shutdown circuit, the 12 volt path is open. So your relays, are, your, your AARs are open. Um, when the IMD fault goes high, the relay still won't close, right? So the relay won't close because this is high. All right, your MOSFET turns on. It connects this node to ground, um, but that node is actually connected to the second, you know, relay pole, and is not actually, you know, it's not turning on the relay. That's this other leg. So what do you do then? Well, you press the button. You press the button. These two contacts on the optocoupler connect to each other, and so since this node was grounded, this node you know, shares that same potential. So yep. now all of this goodness is also grounded. Mm -hmm. So since this, oh, let me draw. Since, oh, uh, there we go. So this leg also becomes grounded and boom, that's the, that's the relay coil. So then these two will close and we're all happy. Um, right, once set reset button is closed, this optocoupler connects its contacts, and pin eight on the relay is grounded, closing both of its contacts. What this does is it allows this red line, it connects these two red lines and allows that current to flow. Um, so one thing I was confused about, and I'm continuing to be confused about, is what is the point of, of this second contact over here? All it does is connect like these two, which already get connected anyways when this is closed. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I needed to check was, is the optocoupler latching? Meaning once you apply voltage, does it stay like that? Mm -hmm. Or is it like a relay or a transistor where you, re where you remove that voltage and it opens back up again? That's something that we'll need to look at the data sheet at. And if it's not clear, mm -hmm. we'll need to ask uh, one of the TAs or whoever designed the circuit about because we can't do any physical testing right now. So, yeah, because I don't know about you, but this, this extra contact seems kind of unnecessary. 
yeah. you might be able to glean some information from looking at one of the other ESFs because they probably have a very similar design. But I have a feeling that this, there's something funky over here. Well, um, this part of the circuit makes sense, right? I think the, the, these like number step, numbered steps. Um, That's good. That's a yeah. really good explanation of what happens and how it happens. Bet. There's not all this crazy like circuit stuff that I need to know. Um, next is this bottom part over here. Um, this part's not super crazy uh, either. Um, mm -hmm. It's just to power the LED. So when there's a fault, we want an LED on the board to turn on. Um, so what happens is the IMD fault signal is high. Um, and therefore, it comes down here to this inverter. Um, and so the output of this, uh, the output of the inverter will be the opposite of whatever's input. So if, we're, if it were, everything's good, high signal, boom, convert to low. MOSFET is, clo is open, like it's not powered, because this, this is low. And your LED doesn't turn on. Because one side is connected to 12, and the other side is connect is, should be grounded. Um, when your fault, is, when you have a fault, your IMD fault will go low. This IC inverter will flip that into a high signal, which will power this. Um, what you call it? Transistor, and ground this LED, which will turn it on. So you'll be able to see the LED is lit. There must be a fault. Um, real quick, you have another. So what you would want to do to figure out these resistor values is you would want to look at the data sheet for the inverter and see what the uh, logic level output is. So you want to see what the voltage output over here is. And based on that, design your resistors. It looks like it just divides whatever this output voltage is in half mm -hmm. because you can see a 10K and a 10K. Well, not half, but like roughly. Basically. No, no. Wait a second. Would that, would that do anything? Hold off. I'm just doing some, I'm just, I'm just doing some whack stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. It'd be half. It'd be half. Right? R2 over uh, R1 plus R2. Right? Yeah, let's go with that. Okay. Um, oh, you know what I can do? Boom. Use piece place? I mean, I could do that. Or R2 over R1 plus R2. Boom. Yep, it just divides it in half. 10K over 10K plus 10K. Wow, I just had a crazy brain fart right there. Um, this is the best of us. Right? It really does. <laughs> it it right. really, really does, but it's fine. So, um, yep, so that would close the MOSFET. Uh, current limit resistor over here, mm, probably current limiting resistor, so you don't accidentally screw anything up. And yeah, that's kind of it. Well, that's mostly it. Um, we went over this first one, which is technically the IMD part. Mm -hmm. And this is the BMS part. The BMS part is identical, mm -hmm. um, as you can see. This whole part down here isn't really part of the board. Um, it's not necessary for the actual PCB to be made, but I edited this schematic to make it for the ESF. Mm -hmm. Where do you to include all this extra garbage down here? Um, yeah. Oh, I should probably add in that you need to have your emergency stop button uh, after the charge shutdown circuit, as with all the other stuff. And you also have an interlock on your charge connector. So yeah. those are two things that you can't forget to do. They're pretty easy to remedy, though, because they're off the board and they're just kind of plug, like, you know, slot in. Other than that, I included the rules. And I think that's just about it for the... Uh,